The United States is a land of immigrants. People come from all over the world seeking the American dream, many of them ending up in Appalachia. Well, while most do well in their new country, there are a few who end up losing it all, many by their own actions. One of these was Nigerian immigrant Peter Odigazua. Hello, podcast listeners. I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, and you're listening to Stories, a History of Appalachia. Steve, I remember this well, and this was just a situation that a lot of people did not think could possibly have happened in Appalachia, but it did, and it brought a little bit of, I guess, international, so to speak, notoriety to Appalachia. And at the same time, gosh, the people in the media here locally, or at least locally in Appalachia, didn't really know how to pronounce and how to make out the Nigerian immigrant's name, because this was just something that just didn't happen here. It happened in other places, but not Appalachia. But as we will soon find out, yes, it did. And it's left some lasting impacts on the community. Well, and and I'm hoping that we're pronouncing it properly, but probably during the podcast, we'll just refer to this fellow as Peter O, just to be on the safe side. Anyway, Odigazua came to America in 1980 working for a large part of the 80s as a bus driver and clerk in Portland, Oregon. He then moved to Ohio, where he enrolled at Ohio State University, then transferred to Central State University studying mathematics. Well, Rod, after graduation, Peter O. became interested in the law, wanting to practice public interest law so he could help those less fortunate. So he began applying at law schools around the country and was accepted at Appalachian School of Law in Grundy, Virginia. Now, he enrolled at ASL and moved there with his wife, who happened to be a nurse's aide, and their four children in the fall of 2000. Well, enrolling in law school and succeeding in law school are two different things, as Peter O. soon found out. He had a hard time academically with the study of the law, which was made worse by having a hard time fitting in with the other students, at least according to him, as Peter O. claimed that other students made fun of him and would leave any room he walked into. And on top of that, he and his wife began having problems, which led to a charge of abuse against him for which he had to appear in Buchanan County Court. And then in the spring of 2001, he flunked out of the Appalachian School of Law, something he kept from his wife and children. And that brings us to another person in this story. L. Anthony Sutton had been a senior member of the Democratic National Committee and worked in the Justice Department under President Bill Clinton. Now, prior to his government service, he'd been a partner in a Washington, D.C. law firm, but Sutton also felt that he owed back for his success. And so he came to Grundy in 1999 to guide the new law school as it geared up to train new lawyers to serve the Appalachian region. Sutton also took Peter O. under his wing. He helped to fund his tuition. He got him a laptop to use for his studies, And when times were tough for Peter's family and the power was cut off, Sutton actually paid to have it turned back on. He even bought him a used car when the family van broke down. And when Peter O. came to Sutton begging for another chance, well, Rod, he gave it to him, allowing him to enroll in the fall of 2001, which turned out to be a big mistake. Well, in the meantime, to make ends meet, Peter O. tutored students, worked part-time at the Van Sant Food City, and worked for a local market research firm located above that Food City store. His wife worked as a nurse's aide at the hospital in the area. The stress on Peter O. continued, though, and it got even worse as the fall progressed. He was again having trouble with his law studies. His wife left, taking their four children with him, leaving him alone there in Buchanan County. Most importantly, Peter Odigazua found an unfired bullet outside the front door of his rented house, which naturally alarmed him. He purchased a gun for protection against whoever put that bullet there, which he felt must have been those folks at the school and around town who were particularly mean to him. At the beginning of January 2002, Peter O. was again informed that he had flunked out of law school and that his financial aid was being suspended. On January 16, 2002, Peter came to the school and visited Professor Dale Rubin to discuss his academic problems. He left that meeting asking for Rubin to pray for him. Well, that same morning, Dean Sutton and his wife, Margaret Lawton, also a professor at Appalachian School of Law, 
had spent time in his office with their brand new baby daughter who they'd adopted from China only three weeks earlier. Around noon, Ms. Lawton and the baby left. Then around one o'clock, Peter O. returned to the campus armed with his 380 ACP semi-automatic handgun. He went to the office of Dean Sutton, where he shot him at point-blank range. He then proceeded to the office of Professor Thomas Blackwell and shot and killed him at point-blank range as well. Anthony Sutton didn't die immediately, though, Rod. An hour later, he was found still laying on his floor, dying from three gunshot wounds, moaning, Peter shot me, Peter shot me. Well, Peter O. went downstairs to the school lounge where he shot four female students, killing one. 33-year-old Angela Dales, and seriously wounding the other three. Dales had been an employee of the school who was now living her dream of attending law school with the goal of setting up her own law practice. The killer then left the building, where he encountered other students, including two Western North Carolina police officers who carried their own personal firearms in their vehicles. Here's where the story takes two different turns. Well, one version has it that at the first sound of gunfire, Tracy Bridges, a sheriff's deputy in Buncombe County, North Carolina, and Michael Gross, a police officer from Grifton, North Carolina, ran to their cars and got their guns, a 357 Magnum and a 9mm pistol, then returned to confront Odigazua, ordering him to drop his weapon. Well, he did so, and several unarmed students then tackled and subdued him. The other version has Peter O. setting his gun down and raising his arms in a mocking manner. Student Ted Beeson, a Marine vet and former police officer in Wilmington, North Carolina, then knocked him to the ground and other unarmed students subdued him, all before Bridges and Gross returned from their trucks with their firearms. At his initial court appearance, Peter O. was found incompetent to stand trial and was referred for psychiatric treatment. In 2005, the treatment was deemed to be successful, and he was found competent to stand trial, so he was brought back to Buchanan County to be tried. Knowing his fate, though, Peter O. struck a plea deal with the Commonwealth's attorney, pleading guilty to the murders in exchange for life in prison. He was sentenced to three life sentences plus 28 years without the possibility of parole and is currently a guest at Red Onion State Prison in Dickinson County. Hmm. I think that's... Uh, interesting that you put it as he's currently a guest <laughs> at Red Onion State Prison in Dickinson County. Huh? Well, well, certainly not it, a guest by desire. I mean, he's there not at his own volition. That's right. It's not something he wanted to. Uh, he looked up on the Internet and decided to book it through uh, Craigslist or something. He just he he was made to go there. There's no other way around it. So, Well, I tell you this, though, seriously, is, is a very sad story. Yes, it is. Um, I know you know of someone who was involved in this shooting. I know of someone who was involved in this shooting. This man is one of those unarmed students that helped tackle Peter O when this mm-hmm. happened. So he mm-hmm. doesn't like to talk about this. It's sort of like um, post-traumatic stress disorder, being involved in something like that. And I think you went to school with one of the victims, if I'm not mistaken, didn't you? Yes, I did. And this is something that... Uh, you know, as long as uh, as they have been around and I've been around them, we've just never talked about this. And I know that it's probably been more than anything a very traumatic experience for them. And when they're ready to talk about it, if they want to talk about it, I'd be more than willing to listen to them about it. But I know this is a very trying time for, for that person and also all those people that were involved at the Appalachian School of Law when this event happened. You know, the thing about this, though, this is one of those early mass school shootings, kind of a precursor to what happened later at Virginia Tech and at all the different high schools around the country. So that made it a bit of history, and it happened right here in the heart of coal country in Appalachia. And that's the story of the shooting at the Appalachian School of Law, part of the history of this place we call home, Appalachia. Thanks for listening. Stories is now available not only on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher, but on a brand new app called Radio Public. Now, if you go and download that app from the iTunes Store or the Google Store, then listen to stories through it, we get a share of revenue, which will help us be able to keep bringing you more of the history of Appalachia. Radio Public also has many of your other favorite podcasts as well. We're on Facebook at Stories of Appalachia and on Twitter at Story Appalachia. Again, thanks for listening. Till next time, y'all take care. So long, everybody.